Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator. So obviously I talk a lot about swords on this channel and certain types of swords get more attention than others. And in fairness, this is partly because of the areas of ex expertise that I have or the uh, collection of swords that I have. So obviously I can mostly talk about what I know the most about and what I have the most access to. But that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't other types of swords and in fact other types of weapons out there that deserve just as much attention, but unfortunately aren't usually able to get it on this channel. Now, one of those types of swords, which really deserves a lot more attention than it gets, online is the, what should we call it? Well, let's call it for now, the curved Islamic sword um, of the, let's say the Middle East uh, and North Africa and the Ottoman, what was the Ottoman Empire. So in other words, the sort of stretch of the Islamic world from North Africa across the Middle East and into Central Asia, in fact. Um, and in fact, all the way to India, actually. Um, so this example I'm holding here is probably an Indian version. And many of you will think, ah, that's a Shamshir. And indeed, I would call this a Shamshir. But that's what this video is primarily about. I have another sword here which in fact is one that's just been sold on my uh, business website for Eastern Antique Arts. And it is, as far as um, my opinion is concerned, it is an Ottoman uh, Turkish sword. It's an officer's sword, a military officer's sword, perhaps with a slightly earlier blade mounted on a later, uh, what's often known in the West as a Mamluk style, or Mameluk as, it, as it's often written, uh, Mameluk style hilt. Okay, so this very characteristic, you know, you'll notice that whilst these swords are different, there are some very common um, design characteristics between them. The overall silhouette is similar. They both share a cross guard. I'll just put one down so that I've got two hands available. They both share a cross guard, which is incidentally shares some characteristics with, with many other um, swords from the Islamic world um, that don't necessarily have the same type of blade or the same type of handle as this. In fact, if we look at the Sudanese Kaskara, there are some parallels here. Certainly the fact that we have this cross shape. And this is something you find uh, quite commonly on Islamic swords. Indeed, you find it on some um, European swords as well. But... Um, the fact that it's got this, uh, essentially this sort of crossed shape here with these langettes that go up and down into the, uh, into the grip is, is a very characteristic part of the design and um, something you find, as I say, on a lot of Islamic swords. And on this type of um, shamshir or kilich, let's call this, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in that second, you very often have these sorts of terminals on the end of the quillons, on the end of the um, uh, guard extensions. So these uh, sort of knobs, should we call it, on the end of the guard are also quite characteristic. They take many different forms, many different uh, varying sort of decorative forms as well. They're not always, um, they're not always the same shape. These are a little bit like uh, acorns on this one. Um, and equally, the, you'll notice that on this guard, it is a very simple um, iron, um, nothing complex or decorative really on the side plates there. Whereas on this one, if I bring it up close to the camera for a second, you can see, see that it has a lot of decoration on there. And this is another thing that varies between uh, the swords. Some of these are um, decorated and some of them are plain. And equally, some of them are treated in different um, surface decoration ways. Some ways have uh, uh, overlay of a go um, silver uh, plating. Some of them have gold inlay, such as koftgari. Um, some of them are made of uh, woots or, or Damascus, um, so pattern welded steel. Um, let's not get into the complications around the term Damascus. That's I've dealt with that in other videos, and we'll deal with it again, I'm sure. Um, so you get minor degrees, well, minor or major actually degrees of decorative difference on these cross guards, but they all share a similar um, silhouette. Okay. Uh, or mostly share a similar silhouette. There are some exceptions. You do get some that have, for example, slightly S-shaped guard where, where the front guards, where uh, essentially a knuckle bow would be on a sabre, curves downwards and the back curves upwards sometimes uh, on some Turkish swords, for example. So you do find different ones, but this type of this cross is a very common and typical type to find. In terms of the grip, um, it's made of a... Uh, composite construction of different parts essentially. Um, they can be made in a number of different ways. I won't say they're all made the same, uh, but generally you have an organic material here. You'll notice that this one is some form of horn. Uh, this one is um, ivory, 
probably elephant ivory, unfortunately, but there we go, it's antique. Um, and um, they usually have a hole through here, which a sword knot type of lanyard could be uh, inserted and often was a silk, usually made of silk. And then they have, on many of them, funnily enough, on, not on this one, I'll talk about this one in a second, on many of them you have a back strap that goes all the way around front and back. And so what you've essentially got here is a hidden tang. Now on some, you see um, sort of essentially rivet points through the grip, a bit like on a messer or indeed on a kitchen knife, uh, that, that rivet through the grips, um, through the tang. On others, you don't. Now these swords, I'll put the, um, put the Turkish one down for a second. These swords did become a model for uh, European uh, generals to wear, particularly after the um, fighting in Egypt during the Napoleonic Wars. And lots of officers during those wars took Mameluk swords, which is why they're often referred to as Mameluk-style sabres, um, took Mameluk, so Egyptian um, military swords, as trophies during the Napoleonic Wars. And it became a sort of, um, an, well, it became an unwritten and then it be did become regulation uh, way of showing uh, that you were a very high-ranking officer if you wore one of these. But there are exceptions to that, okay? So first of all, these were worn by Europeans um, and military officers before the Napoleonic period as well. Um, they do represent other things, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and in addition, it wasn't only generals who wore this style of sword in, let's say, the 19th century. You do sometimes find, for example, certain uh, regiments of hussars had uh, this model of sword as their dress sword, um, which is connected to the next point I'm going to make, and that is these swords weren't only connected to the Egypt campaign and to the Islamic world. They were also connected to the introduction of hussars. Um, now, hussars came into Western Europe basically as a Hungarian Polish uh, influence, um, and so the uh, the very form of light cavalry, their their pelises, their jackets they wore, the types of swords they used, curved swords rather than previous straight swords, um, their whole fashion, even the hairstyles to a degree, and the hats were influenced by Central and Eastern European light cavalry, um, particularly in the 17th century. This started, and that was because during the 17th century and partly during um, conflict and contact with the um, Ottoman Turkish world, these Central and Eastern European horsemen gained a very um, illustrious and high reputation. And so um, it became fashionable in Western Europe to emulate some of their styles, fashions, and indeed weapons. So these types of Mameluk sabers, or let's call them Islamic inspired or Islamic um, uh, design um, sabers, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second because that's a bit more complicated as well, came into the West through a number of different channels and converged uh, for d d various different reasons. But for whatever, you know, for whatever combination of reasons, they ended up quite being quite popular in Western Europe, particularly for generals and particularly for certain types of hussars, more as dress swords, if not necessarily as um, service swords, because of course, Usually, um, you'd have a more complete hilt uh, with a European light cavalry sword, like the 1796 light cavalry sabre, for example. <laughs> now, what I wanted to really address in this video was I see a lot of people on the internet wrestling with the terms Kilich and Shamshir. Um, now, you will notice there is a difference in these blade shapes, not necessarily in the curvature. Let's talk about the curvature separately in a second. But you'll notice that the sword in my left hand here with the ivory grip, as well as curving, and it, both of these swords curve predominantly in the second half of the blade, they're mostly straight in the first half. In the second half of the blade, it tapers to a point and is essentially wedge sectioned. So it doesn't have, in fact, it has no false edge at all. It is a purely single edged sword with a crescent blade that tapers to a point. In contrast to that, the style which became more popular in Turkey, although it wasn't the only style by any means, um, in the Ottoman Empire, has this stepped up what's known as Yelman. And I've referred to Yelman many times on my channel, but some of you may not uh, know what that is. So you'll notice there's a little step here. So let's bring this closer to the camera and focus on the sword instead of my face. There we go. You'll notice that it steps up here and you have a little uh, kind of um, 
I don't know what you'd call that, but a, a block essentially. And then it comes into, it has a, a, um, a grind that brings a bevel, edge bevel in. And so this is completely edged all the way up the back of the blade here. And that portion is called the Yelman, or we could call it a false edge. If you just want to use plain English, it's a false edge, but it's a raised false edge. This was incidentally emulated and copied by makers like Prosser on later pipe back swords in, in the British military. But that's an aside. So the Yelman is a very, uh, it's not unique at all to Ottoman Turkish swords, but it is very characteristic to many, if not all, Ottoman Turkish swords. Um, and as I say, it's not, you do find it in other places. Now, it didn't actually come from, it didn't originate in um, the Ottoman Empire. Both of these sword types seem to have come into the Islamic world from Central Asia um, and from the, uh, the tribes, the horse tribes, uh, that essentially expanded out of Central Asia and uh, awarded with the uh, Islamic states such as Persia, the Persian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, um, and they emulated their swords. So actually the earliest forms of these swords you actually find in Central Asia, they're not really from the um, what we traditionally think of as, uh, as the Islamic world. Islamic swords for the most part during most of the Crusades, the, certainly the first two and three, uh, were basically double-edged str straight swords, ironically, just like the Crusader swords, okay? Not, I mean, they didn't look exactly the same as Crusader swords, but the blades were functionally very similar for the most part. Mostly straight, mostly double-edged, some single-edged. Um, so these highly curved swords with this characteristic style of hilt, um, if not the cross guard as such, but certainly the, the grip, are really a Central Asian, or seem to, seem to be predominantly a Central Asian introduction. Um, probably primarily into Persia and from Persia spread out there. Per the Persian Empire was very influential on the rest of the Islamic world at that time. Okay, so the point I really want to um, hammer home is that when we're talking about a Shamshir and a Kilich, to a certain degree, those two words... Uh, I won't say they're interchangeable because in the modern world they have been become connected to certain swords. So kilich being a, I believe, a Turkish word, um, it, it refers almost always in the modern world to this flared yelman type of sword. Now there is a subdivision of that called a pala, and a pala is a particularly wide and shorter usually version of one of these. This is, some people might refer to this as a shamshir, but what does shamshir actually mean? Well, Shamshir pretty much is the Persian word for sword. <laughs> uh, there is another word, uh, Saif, which, um, uh, which I believe is in several different languages, S-A-I-F, Saif, Saif, not exactly sure how um, to say it correctly, and that also really means sword. However, it should be noted that even going back into old Greek sources, often um, the word uh, Shamshir or, or versions of that, sort of Greek versions of the word Shamshir, are often used to denote a foreign um, or a non-Greek um, sword. So it's difficult to really say, etymologically, etymologically speaking, what exactly the word Shamshir, Shamshir or Shamshir meant originally. Um, my understanding is that it just really means sword and that Kilich also just means sword, just in a different language. But this is where we get into the problems of language and the fact is in the modern world, if we're talking about now in the year 2020, if you say a Kilich to anyone, they'll think of a flared Yelman and if you say Shamshir to someone, they'll think of a tapered to a point blade. But both being highly curved swords and both with um, hilts of a similar sort of design. So they're not defined so much by the hilt, they're defined more by the detail of the blade. Now, one final thing I'll say before I log off um, is that the typical killich that people think about doesn't actually look particularly like this. This is almost like halfway between a killich and, and a shamshir in that it's got the flared yelman of a killich. But what most people think of when they think of the killich is actually the pala, or what most people refer to when they're talking about the pala, which is actually wider than this. It is shorter than this. They've usually only got about 27, 28 inch blades. And it has a very sudden bend to it. Whereas this is a gradual curve through here, and this uh, shamshir is um, more or less straight in the first half of the blade and then gradually curves through the second half of the blade. The traditional pala is like a more exaggerated version of this curve. It is usually almost completely straight in the first half and then there's a kink 
and then it has essentially a second half. So it's almost like two straight bits of blade with a curve in the middle. And that's a very specific shape. And what a lot of modern replicas or, or even modern artwork, when they represent curved swords in art or in replicas, they think that the blade curves through its whole length. And actually, when you look at a lot of curved swords, that's not the case. A lot of curved swords, I'd say probably even the majority of curved swords, are relatively straight for the first half and only curve in the second half. And the reason, of course, for this is that you still want to reach out to be able to hit a target, but when you hit the target, you want to be hitting with that oblique angle slicing edge here. If the blade curved from the very, very beginning, in fact, as some Napoleonic flank officers' swords do, some sabres do, because they're a sort of um, almost a bad interpretation of what a curved sword is supposed to be, it's very difficult to ever reach your target because the whole blade is curving away from what you're trying to hit. So you almost have to be at punching distance to, to actually land a cut. Whereas when you've got a decent amount of extension in the first half of the blade, you can still lay the second half of the blade onto the target, but it hits at an oblique, oblique angle and slices across and through it. Right, so to finish up, uh, obviously this is a very cursory and quick look at these types of swords. Um, I I'm not really an expert on these. There are many better experts out there to be talking about this type of sword. Um, but generally speaking, I wanted to highlight the general modern world difference between a Shamshir and a Kilich what most modern people would describe as the difference in the Shamshir and Kilich, but also to reiterate that ep etymologically speaking, in terms of the actual words, my understanding is that Kilich is just the word for sword in one language and Shamshir is just the word for sword in another language. So actually, if people are being too pedantic about the matter, you can, I think, point out to them that they both just mean sword. And sometimes it's quite difficult in the world of historical weapons to be specific about what weapon we're talking about because often a term, when we use it in a pure historical sense, it comes back to what is a rapier. Um, can actually mean a very vast variety of things. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon. Give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already. And I'll see you again soon for another video on Scholar Gladiatoria channel. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.